Thanks be to God. As many of you may know, this is uh, Mary's uh, last day hanging out with us. And uh, as you also may know, she does not originally come from a Methodist church. So though it is not how I intended it to be, I'm about to preach what m might be the most Methodist sermon I've preached ever. So this is for you. It is a sad but true statement that the church has split so many times over the centuries. It began in 1054 when the East and the West simultaneously kicked each other out over an argument about authority, about bishops, about whether the Pope was the greatest bishop or one bishop among many. After that, further down the road, we get to 1517, where that, that's where it really starts. Things really start splitting up, right? Martin Luther, in whose honor we sang that hymn, uh, he, that's what he wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. He uh, protests the selling of indulgences, the selling of forgiveness for sins. If you ever go to Italy and go to St. Peter's Basilica, that's how they funded building St. Peter's Basilica, the indulgence that Martin Luther uh, reacted against. And, and so they had this argument. Luther protested so much that he got called a Protestant, and uh, it split the church. And so from there, we start splitting off other groups, the Calvinist groups, the Anabaptist groups, all these arguments about uh, what is communion, when can you be baptized, what does it mean to be church? And it, got, it has gotten to the point now where, how many types of Baptists are there? American, Southern, Primitive, right? How many types of Presbyterian? PCA, PCUSA, Wisconsin Senate Lutherans, Missouri Senate Lutherans, ELCA Lutherans. There are just a bunch. We, we have split so many times. And, and Methodism has a unique spot among all of those splits and all of those arguments. Right? All of the other arguments, all the other times the church has split, it's been arguing something about theology, something about the reading of scripture, something about the sacraments. It's, it's been sort of a high flutin sort of academic style argument, you might say. Methodism exists not for, because John Wesley had any particular beef theologically. The thing that starts the Methodist church is a concern for practicality. He didn't think the Anglican church was wrong. He just think it, thought it needed to work better. It needed to be better at making faithful disciples of Jesus. And so and it turns out that the most Methodist question you can ever ask is, but does it work? Right? That is at the heart of Methodism. I'm, all that's highfalutin. Does it work to help people follow Jesus? Or as I would say, does that dog hunt? And if it doesn't, it ain't Methodist. Right? Practicality, that is at the heart uh, of the Methodist tradition. There is one exception. There is one thing that Wesley held on to, one sort of theologically interesting idea something he takes out of scripture that not it wasn't new but it was something that wasn't very commonly pushed but it's in the bible and so wesley argued for it and it has to do with this idea about perfect right we read in philip philippians that uh, i pursue and i seek to be perfect and this one word Wesley was in more arguments about this than I think than anything else he argued about in his life. He defended this idea of arguments, or of perfect, and argument after argument for decades, like 40, 50 years, defending the hearing Philippians 3. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on, I pursue it. Right? That getting there, we're on our way to perfection. That's what scripture says. And if that's what the Bible says, we have to read it and understand it and do something with it. And so Wesley takes this, this idea. It says, be perfect. And, and he defends on one side from people outside the church who say, hogwash. You can't be perfect. That's crazy, right? Don't, don't, pfft, don't give me that about perfect. And, and on the other side, from people outside of the church, he has to argue with, so people outside the church are telling him it's hogwash. People inside the church are giving him flack because they take what he means literally, and, and they're saying, well, no, Wesley, I, I think I'm perfect now. And, and what can you not tell someone who's perfect? What to do, right? It's kind of like, and Wesley spent a lot of time telling folks, the second you claim to be perfect, it's kind of like saying, trust me, if you have to say it, 
you're not. Right? It's kind of the fact that you would even say I'm perfect is proof that you are not. Right? And so Wesley was always arguing about this, and, and he wishes he could have found a better term, but that's what the Bible says. And so what do we make uh, of this? What do we make of this idea of Christian perfection? First, it is all throughout Scripture. Right? It is from the very beginning back in Leviticus we read things like, be holy as the Lord your God is holy. Right? This is another way of talking about perfection, is holiness. Be holy. Right? And we get it all the way, you shall be perfect as the Lord your God is perfect. We get it in Philippi, uh, the letter of the church at Philippi, seek perfection. Right? It is all throughout Scripture. And, and so what is it possible becomes the first question. Does a teacher ever test a student on something they can't do? Not if they're a good teacher. And so if we believe Jesus to be a very good teacher, then we would have to say, if it says that we can do it, then we can do it. Martin Luther understood every commandment in Scripture to have a hidden promise. Because if Scripture says you should do this, then in that is a promise by God that God will make it possible for you to do this. Because God would not ask us to do that, which we cannot do. Right? So this is something we are told to do, and, and it must be possible, or else God would not tell us to do it. So it is possible to be perfect, yet we have to be very clear about what this term means. Wesley goes through this and says being perfect is not saying that we know everything. Right? You don't know everything. We're not going to know everything this side of heaven. Right? To be perfect does not mean that we never make mistakes, we never make bad decisions. That's just not, that's going to happen. Right? We don't know everything, so we're going to make bad decisions. To be perfect does not mean that we are immortal, that we are never going to get sick. Right? That, that doesn't occur either. Nor does it mean that we're going to be free from temptation. Right? We were always going to be tempted. And if you get to the point where you, you don't think you're tempted anymore, Wesley would ask of you, is it that you're not tempted? Or is it that you're giving into temptation so quickly that you don't have the experience of being tempted. With all of these caveats that perfection is not so, perfection in perfect knowledge and perfect judgment, it's not perfection in our bodies or proof against temptation, then what, what actually is perfect about Christian perfection? Christian perfection is to love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that's what it is. Christian perfection is to love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and and strength. Christian perfection transforms us because with such love we would never choose to break God's law. Right? We would never choose to do anything against God. And we experience this ourselves in our own lives in the way that we love others. If you think of the people that you love most, think of the one or two people you love most. Could you conceive of hurting them? Could you conceive of ditching them? Could you conceive of just walking away and never seeing them again? You can't. Right? It's not possible. Love transforms what we even see as possible to do. The people that we love, we, see, we just don't see the options of, of hurting them. Right? And, and in the same way, when we love God fully, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, we just don't conceive of living a life that is anything but satisfying and in line with God's desires and God's will. And what this, this Christian perfection, this love of God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength does is it takes us from some sort of vague sense of, I believe in God. That's great, right? I believe in God. No, I love Jesus, right? I love Jesus, and I don't want to disappoint him. You see, the difference there is it's not just a belief in some God out there, but a love of a person that we want to follow, and that love changes us. It changes who we are and how we live. Now, what it means to live such that we don't choose to turn away from God, to do what God does not desire, is that we actually stop sinning. Because a sin is to choose against God, right? It's the difference between if I'm standing at the door and you trip on my foot on the way out, if I have actively tried to trip you, that's a sin. That's a problem. If you trip over my foot because I wear really big boots, are you going to hold that against me if it's an accident? No. Right? That's not a sin. That's a mistake. That's an accident. Right? And so when we love God fully, we may not always make the right call, 
But we're always making it out of the love of the one who saves us. We're always making it out of the love of Jesus. So Christian perfection is not saying we never get it right, but saying that we're always trying to line up what we're doing with what Jesus desires us. And this love, it draws us into deeper humility, patience, it's understanding. It's always growing, right? Christian perfection is always growing as we become more like Christ. We always become more like the ones we love. Right? You ever notice that? You, you get married, and after a while, your sense of humor and her sense of humor start to rub off on each other. You start to cook like each other. I mean, things start to rub off after a while. It's the same thing. There's actually a term for this. It's called theosis. When you, when you eat at this table of Jesus, you start to look like Jesus, right? This, when we gather around Jesus, we, it, Jesus rubs off, right? Now, there's a way in which we can think of this it's very analogous to being healthy. Christian perfection is very close to this idea of being healthy because being healthy is not something that you ever stop. It's not like you say, ah, I have eaten all the healthy food I need to eat in a lifetime. I've done enough exercise. I'm done. Right? What happens if you do that? Pants stop fitting right? <laughs> real quick. In the same way, we, we keep on seeking to love Jesus fully uh, day after day. And if we stop, if we say, okay, that's it. I'm, I've loved Jesus as much as I need to love Jesus. The spiritual equivalent of the pants stop fitting will occur. And the same thing, in, in another way it's like health is you can never say, like, I'm healthy enough. It's not like you hit a point and say, that's as healthy as I ever need to be, and I can just stop and maintain right there. I never need to get any better. You could always be more healthy. Right? And the healthier you are, the better you feel in the day, and the more able you are able to survive and handle when things happen. The same thing with Christian perfection, with loving Jesus. The, the more you do it, the more you practice and experience the joy of Christ daily, and then when something does go sideways the more you're able to hold on to that peace in the middle of the storm. Hopefully, we continue to grow in our love of God. We continue to move towards living in Christian perfection, knowing that we are deepening this love of Jesus and that it will change over time. Right? At some points, uh, to love Jesus more fully is to focus on service and turning outwards. At some times, it will mean turning inwards and focusing on prayer, but it changes over time. But, but there it is. That is the one distinctive theological contribution of the Methodist tradition that we take this biblical imperative, pursue in perfection, and we work out what that means. It's to love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Does that make sense? I want to make sure to stop. And Are we all on the same page? Any questions? Okay. I was reading the story of Peter and thinking about this. And Peter, Peter is the disciple where if there's an opportunity to talk, he takes it. Every time. Every single time, Jesus is walking on water, and Peter says, hey, can I go out there with you? Right? And when uh, Peter is the one, when, they ask, when Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? Who do y'all, all the disciples say that I am? Peter goes, call on me, call on me. Right? He's always talking when, when they're going down to Jerusalem. And everyone's kind of worried. Peter's the one who says, you know, Jesus, this is a stupid idea. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. You <laughs> Stop talking, Peter. Right? Uh, and uh, when Jesus is staying there with, standing there with Moses and Elijah on top of the mountain at the Transfiguration, as they're about to go down to Jerusalem, Peter is there. And, and instead of, like, listening, what does Peter do? Hey, can we build some tents? Right? He is always talking. Peter is always talking. Right? I, I read Peter, and to be honest, it resonates with, with me because I, I might have a little bit of Peter in me, maybe actually a, a lot of Peter in me. Thank you, Mary. Uh, <laughs> now, does following Jesus transform Peter so that he becomes like a wallflower, settles down, stops talking so much, and is like, chill? Well, have you read the book of Acts? It does not. Right? Every time someone has to represent and talk in, on behalf of the whole church, there is Peter talking to Jerusalem. When they get hauled up on charges in front of the Sanhedrin, the government, Peter is there explaining to everyone who Jesus is. When Pentecost happens, the Spirit comes down and people spread out to, to, to speak in the languages of others. Peter is the one out there telling everyone what is going on. Right? For Peter to be perfect... 
to love Jesus with all of his heart, mind, strength, and soul. It is not for him to be fundamentally different than what he already is. For he is made in the image of God. He is exactly what God wanted him to be, just as each of you are. For me to be, Peter to be perfect is to take who he is and put it under new management. Right? His outspokenness is not something to get rid of. His outspokenness is something to manage so that instead of it being about himself, it becomes harnessed so that it becomes in service to Jesus. Following and loving Jesus does not mean the brash person needs to stop being brash. It means they need to start being brash for Jesus. Right? They're being brash for a new boss. You know those old bumper stickers? Uh, I, my boss is a Jewish carpenter. Uh, that's it, right? That's my say. Who is your boss? Who is the one who guides and norms how I'm going to do things? And uh, brash for Jesus might be the single best description I can give you for our new bishop. He is brash for Jesus, right? And so, if you are quiet or loud, outspoken, stubborn, flexible, introverted, extroverted, whatever you are, Christian perfection is not about changing that. It's about taking who God has already made you to be and putting it under the management of Jesus, so that it is harnessed to seek what Jesus desires out of our love for him. You are each wonderfully and beautifully made. You have amazing skills here. You have amazing talents and temperaments, wisdom and experience. All of you here, you are really impressive, because that's how God made you, and nothing can change that. Christian perfection is taking what is already so wonderful about each one of you and making sure it is used in the ways shaped out of our love of Jesus. And I think that management imagery helps us think through this in a very practical way. For learning how to manage ourselves, that's essential to how we live, right? For Peter, it was for him to learn to take his outspokenness and have it directed in a certain way. There's a lot of things he could have been outspoken on. You think our politics are rough. First century Jew Jewish politics, whoo, right? There are plenty of things he could have gotten involved with, but he had to harness that outspokenness for Jesus at that time and that place, right? And so how do we manage our own particular mix of strengths and weaknesses, skills and temperaments, so that we can confess and manage what is broken and develop what is wonderful for the good of others. For example, some of us get angry. Y'all, anyone here ever get angry? Right? You get angry at times. Following Jesus doesn't mean stop getting angry. Following Jesus means pay attention to what Jesus gets angry about and get angry with him. Right? It's not saying never get angry again. It's saying get angry with him. With God, with God about what angers God. Another example. Um, I have the ability to be certain about myself. For years, I thought I was always right because that's how I was. And then I got over it, right? I, I grew up, it happens, and I got over it. But I still have the ability to sound absolutely certain about something absolutely trivial. It's not a good thing. Like, the certainty part is good. There are things, it is a good and just a wonderful thing. When I, am cert when I tell you something at preaching, I want you to know how certain I am that you are wonderful and beautiful and God loves you. I mean, that's a good thing for you to hear, the certainty, right? It's a bad thing when Olivia and I are talking about going out to eat and she asks, where should we go? Would you like to rant this? This is yours if you want it. I told her she could rant at me at this one. <laughs> but this is what happens. I'll ask Olivia, I'll ask, where do you want to eat? And I'll say, we should go here, right? This is what we should do. And I sound as certain as anything. And then we'll do it. And then afterwards, she'll say, I really wish we could have gone somewhere else. And I'll go, we could have. Well, you were certain. No, I wasn't. Right? I'm going on to perfection, too, right? We, we all have our little things we need to work with. I, I need to continue to work to harness, to put the certainty that I have under new management. <laughs> As I see some discussions occurring. <laughs> right? I am sure that Peter had a few false starts as well. I mean, he was always outspoken, and I have my false starts as well. Whatever our gifts, our temperament, our attitude is, these are the tools that we have been given by God to love God. 
Right? The, t the gifts, the skills, the temperaments, the attitudes we have, they're not a problem, they're the gift. And how we use them to love God is how we put our, ourselves under God's management. It's how we seek to be perfect in, in Christ. The most important question then is, do you believe it? Do you believe that the faith that can transform our future such that we can face death unafraid, can that faith change our lives today? Do we believe that the Holy Spirit, which always points towards Jesus, can empower us now to be more like him? Do we believe that the power of God that will remake and reconcile all of creation can begin to remake our lives today so that we indeed are more perfect and more loving? Wesley defended his belief in this for decade after decade, that the faith that saves us after death is the same faith that can transform us today. If we accept that Scripture does call us to pursue perfection, if we do believe this, that we are indeed capable of being made perfect, being fully in love with God such that we do, never, we do not choose to act against God's will, then what remains is to name what part of our lives needs to be under new management. Right? And then we've got to do something about it, right? I have a worksheet for you today. I'm going to hand this out, and uh, this will probably take you some time to, to figure. Because to say what part of my life needs to be under new management, it, it, it'll take some time. But here are the questions, right? Christian perfection is to love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It shapes our decisions such that we would not choose to act against God's desires. Practically, this means putting ourselves under the management of Jesus. And so, what gift do I need to practice, develop, or turn towards the good of others? Or, what aspect of myself gets me in the most trouble? My worrying, my anxiety, my mouth? Right? Well, what part of who I am gets me in the most trouble? How I, and then how am I going to take the answer to one of these two questions and put it under the management of Jesus? How, how am I going to take the anger that gets me in trouble and harness it so that it is the anger that is in line with Jesus' anger? How am I going to take the outspokenness that I have and stop speaking out just for my own gratification but speak out on behalf of the God who loves me? Right? How am I going to take what God has made me to be and put it under his management? This might take a little bit of time to chew on, but it's going to be good. Right? God loves us just the way we are, and then calls us to Christian perfection this side of death, to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And in calling us to live this, God gives us the promise that it's possible. And I believe it's true. I believe that each one of you can go on to perfection. Each one of you is capable of loving Jesus fully. Each one of you is capable of being transformed by the grace of God. And I look forward to continuing to watch what Jesus